Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word. Thanks for joining me. Today we begin the book of Hebrews. Chapter 4, verse 12, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now the book of Hebrews was written in the 60s, uh, mid-60s A.D., about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The author of the book has long been disputed. Many claim it was Paul. And not that I'm a, you know, a biblical scholar of the original Greek to analyze the stylistic similarities and uh, differences, but I do lean toward Paul as the author, primarily because the format of the letter is very similar to Paul's other, other letters. It approaches first the doctrine, and then the latter portion of the book is the practical application, which was Paul's approach. Now the letter, which can pretty much be determined by its name, Hebrews, the content, a lot of comparisons and illustrations from the Old Testament economy, uh, would suggest it's primarily uh, to Jewish believers. Now it is focused on um, the more uh, the, the deeper theological issues of the Christian faith, and it engages in the logic and rhetorical skills that we see in Paul elsewhere, like Romans. Now the overarching uh, theme of the book is the superiority of Christ and Christianity. You know, again, the New Testament, what is offered under grace. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Now let me just stop there for a moment because the English translation here doesn't really capture the majestic formal opening here. It's kind of like the, if you remember the old the, the movie Star Wars, that crawl that came in a, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Well, it, that's kind of the way this opens. God has spoken throughout history in different ways at different times. Creation, prophets, poems, priests, kings, laws, customs, but has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. You know, Jesus was able to sit down at the right hand of God because His work was done, the work of redemption. Nothing else needs to be added to it. It was completed at the cross. Go to chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So in Romans, Paul writes of those who had the general revelation of creation being without excuse. Now that we have the cross, the word, there is certainly no excuse for us. Verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might test, taste death for everyone. For it is fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now here's a theme we've seen before, most recently in Peter, that suffering brings about perfection. And that was true of Jesus, it's true of us. Verse 11, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Right? We're one with Christ in his sufferings and in his glory. But don't miss the beginning here of verse 14. Drop down to verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now this is powerful. Don't miss this. 
Jesus took on flesh. He became like us so he could take on death. Jesus destroyed him who has the power of death. That is spiritual death, Satan. The result of which is that we do not have to live in the bondage of the fear of death. Now let that sink in for a moment because too many Christians are living in the bondage of the fear of death. Not just physical death, but the fear of what is beyond the doorway of death. If you are one with Christ through saving faith, there is no second death for you. The doorway of death leads to life everlasting. Now, understanding that reality, the reality of the abundant life that we have in Christ, sets us free from the bondage of fear. We don't have to go through life in fear. We go through life in freedom. But wait, there's more. Look at verse 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels. He didn't come to help the angels, the fallen angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham, us. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. All right, that's why he took on flesh. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of people. He became like us so that he could intercede for us. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Now this is expounded upon in chapter 4, so I'm going to leapfrog over <clears throat> Excuse me, to chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, verse 16, this is great, don't miss it. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus can relate to what you are encountering in life. And more than that, all right, more than that, he cares. And he gives us the authority to come before the throne of God to seek and find mercy and help when we need it. Wow, that is powerful. All right, let's go back to chapter four, chapter 3, because we're warned in chapter 3 that our unbelief can keep us from entering into this, into his rest or his peace, like the children of Israel when they left out of Egypt. Look at verse 14 of chapter 3. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. That's those in coming out of Egypt. For who have, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would not, they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They, they sinned. They would not obey. They did not have the faith to believe and obey. All right. So that keeps us from entering the rest, the promise of God. Let's, uh, let's go back over to chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. All right. Don't stop what you've started. Hold on. Keep walking in the faith. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Look at this. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. You see, we've got to have that faith to believe. We've got to take the word of God. And we have to act upon it in faith. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he said, so I swore in my wrath... They shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Verse 11, let us therefore be diligent. All right, we have a responsibility here. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of, intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. 
once again, we see the centrality of the Word of God and its power and its ability to reveal even the thoughts and motives of our hearts that we can't even dissect. But it is the Word received in faith that sets us free. And it is the Word responded to in obedience that keeps us free, allowing us to enter into the promises of God. Wow, what rich stuff today in Hebrews. Father, thank you for your word. And I, again, just ask the Holy Spirit to anoint our ears to hear and, Lord, to receive this word from you and apply it to our lives in the proper way. Lord, may we trust in your word. May we not fall short of your rest. And I pray, Father, today for those that may, maybe maybe for the first time, have stumbled upon this video. Lord, I pray those that have a need that are in Christ Jesus, that they would understand that they can boldly come before the throne of grace and find help in their time of need because of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, looking forward to the book of Hebrews. Until next time, keep standing on the Word.